send two people down the trail now and look for any more prints like this. The initial analysis of the print seems to indicate it's from an unknown species. It might be a bear. The, the problem we have, and it's an important point to note, is that the most common misidentification of Yeti prints yes. are bear prints. Yes, yes. Because bears, when they walk, that their, their prints can look very much like human prints. They're, they're rounder at the heel and they're, they, they're shorter than human prints, but because they often overlap when they're walking slowly, it can make it look like a big okay. human print. Mr. Yagihara knows what I'm talking the, about. The, the animal puts its back foot yeah, into the front, exactly. front foot print exactly. as, it, as it walks. Exactly. Which so, can give you a perception of walking on two feet rather than Yeah, gives you a... Or, exactly. Now, that's one of the mysteries we're trying to solve here. The Himalayan bear is obviously active in this area, but not active at this time of year. Between October to March, April, bears are supposed to be in hibernation. Here, it, in the middle of January, it looks like we've got some bear activity. We, that's, that is very, very interesting scientifically. And I, I'm not sure what conclusions we can draw from that. World-renowned mountaineer Reinhold Messner is skeptical of the existence of the abominable snowman. I have seen a huge creature. Messner was climbing at an altitude of 13,000 feet. It was very late in the night. I was searching for a village, but there was no village. I crossed a huge river. There I was afraid. And being out and being insecure what I'm doing now, maybe it's better I sleep somewhere in, 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 in the wilderness. As he searched for a safe place to bed down, he became aware of an unsettling presence. I went a little bit further and there was this creature, maybe 15 meters in, apart from me, in front of me. Messner watched as a beast emerged from the darkness. I could see a very strange figure, but I could not say what it was. It was dark, so I could see a figure bigger than a human being, hairy, on two legs, and I could see afterwards the footprints, and the footprints were exactly like the footprints of the Yeti. The encounter so frightened him that Messner trekked through the night instead of camping. Messner was determined to find out what he saw. He now believes it was the Himalayan brown bear. Messner thinks the reason it is misidentified is because the animal has adapted to the extreme environment. The difference between the brown bear, the normal brown bear in the Himalayas, is the size. Uh, the Himalaya bear, the Tibet bear, is much bigger and the hairs are much longer. Probably because it's colder. Messner believes the reason the bear was feared is because it competed with early man for food. When the human beings were there, the, the snow bears, they came, they stole some animal. And so human beings and these uh, wild, big animals, they came in touch. And so the legend was born. And from time to time, somebody could see again in the night some big animal, dangerous animal, the footprints in the snow like human footprints, much bigger, like uh, from a man who went on two legs. Messner is not alone in his belief. One characteristic of bears is that they can stand, they can stand upright, and they can even walk for short distances. Piero Genovese is a wildlife biologist who studies bears. He says it's quite possible that bears could be mistaken for another creature. When a brown bear stands on his legs, it can be perceived as a figure more similar to a human or a big ape. Genovese says the remote habitat makes it difficult to study the Himalayan brown bears. We know very little about them. They inhabit very remote, very inaccessible areas of the mountain ranges of the Himalaya. Uh, the population of bears living uh, in the Himalaya is one of the most threatened in the world. We know very little, but we know that the uh, total numbers are very likely very low. Experts do know that the physical characteristics of Himalayan bears vary from those of brown bears in other regions. Well, bears can live in very different areas of the world, and this is uh, 
uh, related to their particular ability to adapt to different uh, climate as well as habitat uh, conditions. In this area, usually bears live in very high altitude where they find the grasses in the Himalayan meadows, and they, but they also feed on roots and berries and other vegetables. Like Mester, Genovese believes the tales about the abominable snowman are simply a case of mistaken identity. Uh, there is one local guide at a certain point started screaming that there was a, a yeti and uh, they looked at the distance at an animal that was very similar to a bear and was behaving like a bear, like standing. In that case it was quite clear that local people could perceive an animal moving like a bear as a yeti. Zoologist Ian Redmond is searching at a lower elevation where there is more vegetation and potential prey for this creature that is said to hunt yak. But I'm very keen to break off from the main expedition and spend some time with as small a number of people as possible in the forest. And that's where I think we'll increase our likelihood of seeing something. The group's small size puts them at greater risk should the creature choose to attack. Redmond has met up with a local hunter for protection. Um, I would like to follow his advice on where we might see uh, um, yeti tracks or signs where they might be feeding, if they come down to drink to the river. Um, those are the sort of places we're looking for. We don't yet have that evidence, that, that skull in the hand that, that we need to confirm that the yeti exists as a living flesh and blood animal. But eventually I think we will find that um, because I can't see how else all these tracks can be explained away. My hunch is that the Yeti doesn't spend all its time up in the snow. It makes more sense to me as an ecologist to look a little bit below that in the valleys where there's lots of vegetation, um, lots of potential food. Dr. Redmond is searching areas where a predator might stalk its prey. There's a very nice um, play of cat print here. Uh, the hunter describes it as a tiger, but it's part as well for tiger. Redmond is able to identify two species roaming the area around the river. So when we saw the, um, the deer and the cat tracks crossing the, the trail just near the bridge, I wanted to understand whether all along the riverbank there are deer and cat tracks or other animal tracks. The cat I could see walking across the bridge. That suggests that the deer are moving up and down here and the cat was crossing the bridge. I suspect that if the Yeti is an omnivore, foraging in a river valley like this, turning over stones looking for crayfish or, or whatever else lives in these streams, uh, could be a, a way of, of foraging that a Yeti might use. And that would mean that, that there's a good chance of seeing um, signs of their work, if not actual footprints. There are more encouraging signs of potential food sources for a large primate. I just, uh, just found, stuck to my sock, a plant that in England we call cleavers or goosegrass or bed straw, but it, the leaves are covered in tiny little hooks. And this is actually the main bulk food item of the mountain gorilla. <laughs> so to find galium um, up here, well, it's another item that um, yes, it might eat if they have a diet anything like mountain gorillas. North is that away, yeah. so I think we should go down and then up into that valley, so that we're on the other side of this hill. Yeah. Um, so this is a great spot with all these footprints, but I think we should move down the river and then try and go up the valley yeah. over there. Okay. Okay. Can you explain that to the hunter. This. Um, this to me looks like uh, like baboon droppings. In Africa, I would say, or oh, baboon sat here. Yeah. But here you have um, macaques and lats, yeah. uh, I think. You can crack it open and see what the animal has been feeding on. Yeah. And this is uh, fairly well chewed grass stems by the look of it. And this is seed pods. Um, I'm not quite sure what that was. I thought it was maybe a bit of bone, but it's not. It's, it's all plant material. I was hoping to see some insects. Uh, remains in there too. But maybe in winter there are not, not so many about. I, c I can see there's quite a few um, bits of, of monkey dung on the rocks. Obviously they like to sit here and 
and taking the sunshine. Um, but uh, I'd like to go up the river further. Yeah. And when it gets easier to cross, I'd like to two of us work on either side. So there's a nice sandy patch here, and there's the fresh deer tracks. And there's also an old boot print. So some time ago, someone, maybe one of the hunters, came this way. It's clearly a logical place for anyone coming up this bank to come between this rock and the river. So I think this will be an ideal place for a camera trap. Redmond will place camera traps to see what animals are visiting the area. And here's trap one and here's trap two. What I'd like to do is to get one trap up in the, uh, in the woods and then maybe one back near the first bridge. Redmond marks the location of the cameras with a GPS, so we can locate them quickly. Just down there, there are some fresh um, big cat pug marks. They're occasionally hitting the, um, the soft earth and leaving tracks. But if we're thinking like a, a bipedal hominid, which is what, if the accounts are to be believed, that yeti is likely to be, when it comes along here, it would probably go up between those two boulders. I would, and I suspect any tall, thin animal would. And so that's where I'm going to put the next camera trap. This is a stunningly beautiful valley. And just as I came around the corner, a vulture took off from that rock. So I want to go up and have a look and see if there's a carcass there. And if there is, then perhaps put a camera trap there and see if anything else comes to investigate it. Dr. Redmond is aware that a carcass would mean that its predator cannot be far away. So we come around the corner, we see a vulture take off. We think a vulture is likely to be eating something, and here's a bone. And I suspect that where there's one bone, there'll be some more. The second, uh, second shoulder blade here. Dr. Redmond discovers a mountain goat that has been slaughtered. Whoops, steady on. Hello. Um, from the shape of the horns, it's, it's I think, a goat of some kind. I'll, uh, probably we can take these horns back. I was wondering if there might be a bit of meat on the legs too, but I think most of the good meat's gone. <laughs> if there is a large bipedal yeah. primate, like yeah. a yeti, up yeah. here, and there's not much food up here, yeah. this might not just be of interest to cats and dogs, yeah. it might be of interest to yeti. Yeah. So I suggest we um, set up the camera trap, maybe just right on that tree there. Yeah. That's pretty good. Redmond decides to stake out the carcass and wait for the beast to return. If I'm not back by midday, start to come and look. But don't come early in the morning because that's when all the action might be happening. Redmond gets settled in as darkness descends. He's hoping to see something at first light. Well, here we are at 9,450 um, feet perched on a large boulder, jutting from the side of a cliff, about 150 feet above a glacier-fed stream that's rushing by down there. It's potentially a, a dodgy place to fall asleep, but we do want to be here at first light. So we're going to wrap a little bit of uh, parachute cord around our middle and tie it to this bamboo, so that if we do roll over in the night, we'll feel it and that'll wake us up. Um, and, uh, well, it should be quite a night. Monster Quest is searching the Himalayan mountains for a yak-killing beast known to the Western world as the Abominable Snowman. What did it look like? Tell me, what did you see, Kusang? Tell me! I see, I see what, what men must not see. To locals here who knew of the beast long before the arrival of Westerners, the creature is known as the Yeti. I think that people were nervous about the Yeti. I'm talking about the Sherpas, the high mountain people, the Butias and the Sherpas, because they didn't know exactly what it was, and because it was manlike, and because they said it did scream at night. Peter Byrne was the leader of several expeditions back in the late 1950s. 
We put together Sherpa 2.0.